Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to my uh, session. My name is Wei Wu. I'm from the Institute of Information Engineering, Chinese Academy of Sciences. And this is a joint work with Penn State University. OS kernels are written in low-level language like C and C++. Large programs written in low-level language are inevitably to have bugs, such as OOB access, UAF, data risk, and even type confusion vulnerabilities. Uh, thousands of kernel bugs are reported last year, and some of the bugs are very dangerous because they are exploitable. To protect OS kernels, we have a lot of mitigations. Mitigation makes exploitation harder. Uh, actually, uh, exploitability for each bug is a predicate about whether and how easily it could be exploited under the constraints of a set of exploit mitigations. To get a good proof of the exploitability, we need to give concrete kernel exploit. To generate concrete ex kernel exploit, we have automatic exploit generation systems. The workflow behind AEG system usually consists of two steps. In the first step, they identify exploit primitive. Exploit primitive is a machine state which somehow empowers an attacker to craft the exploit. The second step of AEG system is to evaluate whether this exploit primitive could really be used to generate a concrete exploit. Depending on the type of available exploit primitive, we choose different exploit techniques to finish the exploit. Control flow hijacking is one of the most popular exploit primitive. Many exploit techniques have been developed for post control flow hijacking. To craft a control flow hijacking exploit, before triggering the vulnerability, the first step is adjusting the system cores and the parameters and the in the POC to adjust the memory layout. And by triggering the vulnerability, we could get a control flow hijacking primitive. After that, the last step is executing exploitation payload. We can export the payload through shell code or return-oriented programming. There are many research works tackling these challenges. The question is, despite the long list of existing tools, is it really easy to be able to execute arbitrary drop payload in Linux kernel with a control flow hijacking primitive? To answer the question, let's take a closer look into a key step during the exploitation. On one hand, at the site of the control flow hijacking, as shown in kernel state S, the program counter is under our control, but stack pointer is not. On the other hand, to use return-oriented programming to execute exploitation payload, we have to construct a new kernel state S prime. In the new, in the new kernel sta state, not only the program counter, but also the stack pointer is controllable. So we can execute drop payload to for example, escalating the privilege to root, fixing the memory corruption, safely returning to user space, and launching a root shell. The remaining problem is how to construct the transition from state S to state S prime. The transition at the first glance seems quite straightforward to experienced hackers, but sometimes we have trouble in this, in this step. In next, next a few slides, I will explain the challenges for the drop bootstrapping task. The first challenge is exploit primitive, uh, mitigations. A bug in kernel may lead to corrupted code pointers and data pointers. Hijacking corrupted code pointer to execute user space share code is blocked by SMEP. Hijacking kernel sensitive data pointer to user space is blocked by SMAP. The return to DIR attack hijacks a corrupted code pointer to execute shell code in face map. However, this exploit technique is blocked by marking memory pages in face map as non-executable. To overcome SMEP as well as SMAP, another exploit technique tries to modify the control register CR4 by zeroing out two bits in this register, an attacker could turn off both protections. However, such attempt to override control registers could be easily detected by, uh, by the virtualization-based hypervisor. The attempt to override the control registers could, uh, will, will trigger a VM exit signal and the hypervisor could handle the situation. 
Recently, some smart hackers also come up with new export shortcuts. For example, the kernel function called use mode helper could facilitate exportation by invoking a user a, a, a root process by executing arbitrary binaries. However, it is also eliminated by a kernel patch, which only allows the ex execution of whitelisted binary. The second challenge is how to handle your suited export primitive. As we mentioned before, a common export technique is to pivot the kernel stack to user space with the gadget. As shown in the figure, the, the gadget is exchanged EX with ESP and return. But unfortunately, it is blocked by SMAP because the new stack is in user space. Alternatively, one may think of finding a stack pivoting gadget inside the kernel space, such as exchange RDI with SP and return. So we can pivot stack pointer to a fixed stack in kernel space. However, in practice, such gadget sometimes does not exist. Another limitation is lack of control of general registers. For example, using copy from user to copy rope chain into current kernel stack frame, but it is still challenged because of lack of control registers. Copy from user requires controlling three parameters, but usually we only control one of them. The last challenge is export, exploit past pitfall. To under, understand this challenge, let's look into another common practice in exploit development. The export technique triggers a vulnerability for multiple times, and I, at each time it executes part of the payload. Such practice under the context of some vulnerabilities could dramatically decrease the success ratio of an exploit. This is because memory corruption could happen simultaneously with a control flow hijacking primitive. And the kernel could dereference an inv invalid address during the process to returning to user space and the trigger the vulnerability again. To tackle these challenges, an ideal solution is to circumvent this exploit pass pitfall. To do that, we could uh, adopt a single shot exportation, which is similar to the so-called magic gadget in user space exportation. As is shown in the figure, the single shot exportation redirects the control flow to smash the kernel stack and execute arbitrary drop chain without stretching a control flow hijacking primitive twice and detours the potential exploit path pitfall. Having these challenges in mind, let's look into how Kepler achieved the one-shot exportation. I will first introduce the uh, one-shot exportation at a high level. After that, uh, let's look into the details of its build, basic building blocks. To understand the design of Kepler, let's first go over the de design of the single-shot exportation at high level. Starting from the initial control flow hijacking primitive, the first step is to direct the control flow to execute a function called blooming gadget to increase the control of general registers. The second step is to direct the control flow to the bridging gadget. Bridging gadget spawns two control flow hijacking primitive. The first one is used to leak stack canary through the combination of auxiliary gadget and disclosure gadget. And the second one is used to construct a stack overflow against the current kernel stack frame with arbitrary rock payload as well as the stack canary we just leaked. Finally, we could reach arbitrary raw payload execution. We choose raw because it's Turing complete. In the next few slides, I will describe these building blocks in detail. The core building blocks of Kepler is a stack smashing gadget. Stack smashing gadgets are invocation sites of fun function copy from user. Copy from user is a data channel between user space and the kernel. The destination of copy from user is usually a local variable on kernel stack. This is great for exportation because we can reuse the calling size of copy from user to set the register RDI to current kernel stack frame without knowing its precise address. As shown in the right-hand side of the code, the destination buffer is a local variable. Another interesting code style is uh, safe invocation of copy from user. To make kernel code more robust, the return value of copy from user is checked. If an error occurs during the invocation of copy from user, the function will return immediately and start executing our raw payload. To force function copy from user to return a non-zero value, we could construct a page fork during the copy process. 
the, the plan sounds good, but the kernel will panic because the kernel is protected by stack kernel. Uh, and uh, the, another problem is we do not control the source address and the size of the copy. Let's first take care of the stack kernel. Kepler uses another family of gadgets called stack dis disclosure gadgets, similar to the previous they mentioned the stack smashing gadget. The ability to leak canary is empowered by the kernel function copy to user. The function copy to user also takes three arguments, indicating destination, source, and length of the data to copy from kernel to user space. As shown in the curve listing, if the kernel function copy to user returns a non-zero value, the caller function get time of the day will return an error immediately. And by redirecting the control flow to before the calling size of copy to user, we can set the source buffer to kernel stack and force the consecutive execution to take short return paths by constructing a page fault. However, the problem here is the caller of copy to user is also protected by stack canary. To pass the stack canary successfully and return, we need the auxiliary function gadget. The basic idea of auxiliary gadget is straightforward. Kernel performs canary check in function epilogue. It, it just wants the legal canary before the return address. So we could just give it one to make it happy. To do that, we first direct the execution to the auxiliary function gadget, which creates a fake stack frame and stores the stack canary before the return address. We make sure the stack frame is of the same size of the caller function of copy to user. There is an indirect call in the auxiliary function. The target of indirect call is controllable. We redirect, we redirect the control flow to canary disclosure gadget. When the canary disclosure gadget fails to copy the last byte and it returns, it will find, it will find, uh, it will find the canary stored by auxiliary gadget. And all functions in the same kernel threads share the same stack kernel. Kernel has no reason to reject our return. As I mentioned before, to invoke function gadgets like a copy from user and a copy to user, we need to control more registers. To do that, we use Blooming gadget. The code of Linux kernel sometimes is similar to object-oriented programming. The self object is usually passed as the first parameter, and it is the reference for target and parameters of an indirect call. As shown in the code listing, the function accepts a pointer to the VMA object VMA is the reference the multiple times to, for, to get the target and the parameters of an indirect call. Given the VMA points to a controllable region, we can get a better state through the gadget. In the new state, we are good to use function gadget because we control three registers as parameters. In order to combine the operations of disclosing stack canary and the smashing stack into a single shot, we need the assistance of bridging gadgets. Bridging gadgets are kernel functions containing multiple controllable indirect calls. Bridging gadgets spawns two opportunities to hijack a control flow. We can combine the operations of canary leak and the stack overflow into a single shot. For example, function reg cache mark dirty is a bridging gadget which performs two indirect calls. If we let the map points to the phase map region under our control. We can use the indirect call lock to execute auxiliary and the disclosure gadget to leak the stack kernel, and use the second indirect call unlock to execute the stack smashing gadget. The implementation of Kepler contains two modules. The first module is a static analysis module. We collect the candidate gadget through static analysis plugin built on Ada Pro. In the second module, we convert the export chain identification as a tree search problem over the candidate gadgets. The search tree contains five steps corresponding to the previously discussed building blocks. We also employ multiple workers to explore the search space concurrently. The gadget stitching engine is built on Angular. To prune the search space, we perform constraints satisfiability check at multiple key locations. We mitigate state explosion by setting threshold of the maximum step in each stage 
and the maximum time of entering a loop. To evaluate the capital, we collect 16 CVEs and uh, three CTF challenges about Linux kernel. These vulnerabilities are known to be control flow hijackable, including OOB access, user-free, double-free, integer overflow, and uninitialized use. The table shows whether Kepler and the existing tools could generate exploits for our vulnerability. Kepler generated exploits for 17 out of 19 bugs, and it outperformed the existing exploit hardening tools because Kepler has the capability of bypassing widely deployed kernel mitigations and do not rely on stack pivoting gadget or triggering a bug for multiple times. Kepler could also find many different export chains. From the right-hand side figure, we can find the number of different candidate gadgets for each vulnerability, the time to find the first ex uh, exportation chain, as well as the time to finish the search. The total number of identified export chains is also listed. Kepler could find the first export chain in 50 work clock minutes, and in total, tens of thousands of export chains. The export chain generated is hard to defeat because this function gadgets used by Kepler could not be easily removed from the kernel. In summary, we propose the single shot exportation technique. It is an effective and a generic kernel exportation technique. We implement Kepler to facilitate identification of single shot exportation chain, and we open source the tool to prevent control flow hijacking attacks. Um, CFI solutions with low overhead should be considered and uh, widely deployed for a major release of Linux kernels. Thank you for your attention. And I'm ready for questions. All right, well, while well, those questioners come on up, um, I'm interested to know a little bit about the robustness of the kind of uh, susceptibility to like the single shot, right? So what happens if you did like something like fine-grained uh, randomization at a function granularity? Uh, would that be problematic or? Oh, if there is a randomization like a KSLR, uh, we needed the cooperation of a info leak vulnerability so that we can leak the, the address of the gadget that we need to use in the exploitation. For, fine, so for more fine-grained uh, uh, randomization, uh, I didn't see uh, implementation for Linux kernel, so I cannot draw any conclusion. Okay, but something that did fine-grained re-randomization would probably be a little bit challenging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or for re-randomization, okay. it would be very, very challenging. We can't, we can't hear you, so. Thanks, sorry. Uh, hi, my name is David um, from UC Irvine. A great talk. Um, which versions of Linux did you look at? Uh, excuse me? Uh, which kernel versions did you look at, the latest uh, versions? Uh, the, the version of the kernel yeah. uh, is 4.15. Uh, yeah, at the time of the writing of the paper, it is the uh, uh, most uh, recent uh, Linux kernel version. Did you look at any other versions or only that one? Um, I, after, the, the, after the project, I also used it to generate exploit for uh, vulnerability in kernel 4.20. Uh, it also works in 4.20. 4 and uh, for more recent version, I have not, have not tested it yet. OK, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Anil uh, from IBM Research Zurich. I had a question on your slide 19, I think, two, two slides before. You have these numbers for the first chain time. Uh, no, the one before that one, the 18, yeah. Um, so I can see for some of them, there's a lot of repetitions of, say, 17 minutes. Is it because it finds the same exploit chain because the initial conditions are the same, or is it? Another reason. The, the so, uh, you were asking about the time, right? 
uh, or the total number of eggs were generated? No, the first, chi the first chain minute, I just noticed that it's 70 oh, minutes, right? Yeah. So I, I was just wondering if you, if you tend to find the same exploit chains because of the same initial conditions that you have as your, um, basically as your restriction for, your, for finding your exploit chain. So how um, generic are the exploit chains that you find is the overall question. If you um, yeah. yeah, yeah. As we can see from the figure, the, the number of candidate gadgets for, for each vulnerability is different. This, this, is, this is because the, the context of each bug is different. Um, uh, you asked a very good question about the reusability of, uh, of the generated exposure uh, chain, but I have not do statistic about, about uh, the, the, the data you want. So, okay. um, yeah. very good. Sorry. All right, once again, let's thank our speaker.